Hello everyone, welcome to Cruising Through History with Scott Cruz. I'm Xander, and Scott, what are we talking about today? Today we are talking about the theft of the Mona Lisa. Okay. And that, that occurred in uh, 1911. That occurred in 1911, so yes. no, other, no other theft. It's just the one. Just the one that I'm aware of. <laughs> okay. So so what happened? So if Mona Lisa somehow gets stolen, because I imagine if you look at it today, that thing is behind like bulletproof glass it is you know, actually you, you can't watch it you can only watch it for like 10 30 minutes like there's a limit there's yes, a line yes security is crazy how did this so get what stolen? happened uh, a man named this vincenzo perugia he was an italian who worked in paris briefly had worked for the louvre he wasn't working there at the time uh, so on august 20th 1911 which was a sunday he was there as a visitor and he decided to hide in a broom closet overnight. Now there's there was another story that says that there were two other people involved, but I can't, everything else I've read said it was just him. Mm -hmm. uh, he had actually worked at the Louvre, but he did the glass frame around the painting, okay. so he knew how to take it off. Okay. So he hid in the closet. Uh, next morning, Monday, the Louvre was closed to uh, patrons. Uh, people couldn't come in. Visitors, I call them patrons because I work in a library. Mm -hmm. And so uh, visitors, so you couldn't, there was no one in there. The gallery was empty, the gallery that it was in. And so he basically was wearing a white, he put on a white smock that the employees wore. So he looked like an employee. Now employees were still there. Yeah. Just that no visitors were there that day. So everyone's like, I'm in a white smock that day, no visitors, just people working there and this guy. And this guy, and this guy basically walked up in the, it was called the Salon Carrere. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, my French isn't great, so. <laughs> well, you got the guy's name right, I think, as far yeah, as I'm yeah, aware. Exa exactly, so. Um, I'm not trying to pronounce that. Right. So. He basically walked up, he took it off the wall, because he knew how to unhook, yeah. take it off the hooks, yep. and took off the frame and the glass, and tried to fit it under his smock, but what he realized is he was, he was a short man. Mm -hmm. And so the smock didn't cover the whole painting, okay. if he wore it. So what he did is he took the smock off, he wrapped up the painting, he proceeded to walk out, and the door was locked. He even tried, and he couldn't get out, I think he was trying to go out the door that the employees would use, mm -hmm. so it would look less conspicuous. Yeah. Instead of walking out the front door, which was probably locked as well. And so, <laughs> It gets a little comical because he took the doorknob off, but this just then a plumber who worked for the Louvre came up and helpfully opened the door for him. And so basically he walked right out and uh, he took the, the painting back to his apartment, put it into a uh, trunk of some kind, and that's where it sat for two years. Two years. He didn't even like take it out. The he wasn't like, you know what? I'm gonna look at this. Well, this. there there was some speculation why it took him so long to try to unload the painting. This is mm -hmm. how they caught. Um, maybe uh, some people said maybe it was reverse Stockholm syndrome. Maybe he fell in love with the painting, <laughs> and so. And I'll tell you, it, it, it's kind of funny. I was looking at pictures of the Mona Lisa this morning, just on Google Images, just on my computer. And even then, you get kind of transfixed if you look at it long enough. Because the way Leonardo painted it so brilliantly, it's that it, it looks, you know, it looks like it's staring at you as it is. And almost like if you stare like it, almost looks like the eyes might move or something. It's just a weird. It didn't affect me at all. You know, destroy all. You know, I didn't start doing that kind of thing. <laughs> Leonardo's but. plan to take over the world <laughs> started with the Mona Lisa. Yeah, and actually, there's a very good biography writ written by Walter Isaacson, uh, just called Leonardo da Vinci. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of illustrations of his, and he has a chapter on the Mona Lisa because there's always been some mystery, who is it? They pretty much figured out who it was by now. But So yeah, so he went back to his apartment, and there, the, there it sat for two years. And the interesting thing about all this is that the Mona Lisa wasn't famous then. As you can tell by the fact that there was hardly any security around. Yeah, that someone could just walk in, you know, even, okay, not walk in. He stayed it's over the night. But right, still, there was some planning, some, yeah, but, you but, know. But, you know, to walk out with it and no one noticed, like, I'm, 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 I'm thinking of this whole moment. I'm just like, so, this guy, 
he came in, he looked, you know, he looked like an employee, but as soon as he put that smock over the painting and then just decided to walk out, no one just... Well, the answer to that is at the time, they were doing a project at the Louvre where they were taking pieces of artwork out to photograph them. Oh. So even though the museum staff was faced with tons of ridicule for what happened, there was a little bit of an explanation that people had been taking paintings out for like the last couple of months, but then returning them. Mm -hmm. And they would wrap them, not so much in these smocks, that he just had a smock on, yeah. but they would wrap them in some kind of cloth. And so a lot, that's why that plumber probably thought, well, this is just a guy, It'll, he'll bring it back tomorrow or yeah. something, we'll see it tomorrow. And it's above his pay grade to care. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you'd say that for those days, yes, yes. So, And so um, at the time, there was a, a French detective who was very well known in the early 20th century named Alphonse Bertillon. And he had actually come up with uh, the concept of the mugshot and the crime scene photo and this kind of scientific typical approach, kind of like Sherlock Holmes, but you know. Mm -hmm. And so he was assigned to the case. He only had a finger, they had found a fingerprint. And then the doorknob that when, when Perugia left the uh, Louvre, he threw the doorknob into the gutter by the street. And so there it sat and someone realized it was the doorknob to this door. And so they, that was all their only clues. Ironically, they thought it couldn't have been professionals because it would be really hard to sell it, even then, because it was known in art circles. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so they realized that they thought it was a museum employee. And in fact, they were kind of on the right track. But then you get these sort of funny things that happen. So they went through the whole roster of employees that had worked at the Louvre. There were like 257 of them. Jeez. Yeah, this was painstaking. This is, this is before databases of employees. You couldn't right. look it up. Right. And so they interviewed Perugia twice in his apartment. So, <laughs> so picture this. This is almost like, I know this is a common trope in, you know, you see it in the Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe where the body's under the, under the floorboards. Uh -huh. It's even in The Simpsons. There's a Simpsons episode where... Principal Skinner is trapped in his garage after newspapers fell on him. He was trying to do recycling. And he keeps yelling, I'm in here! And the police don't hear him and walk out of his house because they think he's missing. Mm -hmm. But this, this was happening. So, so they're basically standing in the apartment. The painting's in a trunk, probably not far away from him. And they interviewed him twice. Mm -hmm. But they said, there's no way this guy could possibly have stolen this. <laughs> he's just too simple-minded to have figured this out. And we're not talking, you know, he went in, you know, with the, you know, he have those lasers and people will lower themselves and spray the thing. Uh -huh. That was, none of that was happening. Basically, it was on a wall. You could look at it. There it was. And the painting was missing for 26 hours before someone realized it was gone. The Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa. And the person who realized it was gone wasn't an employee. He was a self, uh, he was like a, not a professional artist, just a guy who'd like to, because people would sometimes go to the Louvre and actually paint there. Yeah. And so he was in the Louvre painting and he noticed the wall was empty. And that's how they noticed. Like, you know, you read this and it's almost incredible because of how we think of the Mona Lisa now. Yeah. You, know, you think, how in God's name did it sit, the wall was empty. I mean, you could clearly see there was no painting there. And then they finally noticed and that led to I guess we call it CYA or something. You know, a lot of people trying to cover themselves. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't say the full phrase, but a lot of people are trying to cover themselves because the French journal, journals went, the newspapers went insane with this because they were just pointing out, they just reveled in this pointing out how incompetent the government was and the Louvre staff for allowing this to happen. Their, their national treasure was gone, which is funny because no one really thought of it that way before. So it's yeah. almost like you don't know what you got till it's gone and it was gone all right. And ironically, it wasn't French, it was Italian. And that's one of the reasons Perugia gave for stealing it because he said when he had worked at the Louvre, he had heard that Napoleon had looted Italy mm -hmm. of a lot of artworks. And he's right, he did. But he didn't loot the Mona Lisa. In 1516, 
of King Francis I of France, he invited Leonardo to come to France, and uh, Leonardo took the what was an unfinished painting with him, which was the Mona Lisa, and then. King Francis purchased it, and then it became, after the revolution, it became the property of the French Republic. Okay. So that's how that whole chain of command, or whatever you call it, <laughs> chain of evidence, or what have you, so, possession. So, so let's, let's go back to the truck and the, the apartment, because uh, that still, still baffles me. So he was interviewed twice in there, mm -hmm. and they said he was simple-minded, but... Is there, is there more documentation on how those interviews went? Because I can't imagine the guy who stole the Mona Lisa having it in the trunk. That's probably, I mean, I'm imagining the trunk was probably even visible at the time, but, you know, it's hidden in the inside that trunk. Right. But he's being interviewed, and the guy's got a straight face so much that they think he's simple-minded. There's no way he could have taken it. It's really weird. There isn't a lot of evidence, you know, there isn't a lot of documentation on how these interviews went. And even how his trial went, because he, he was, you know, eventually was caught. And uh, it's just strange that there's not a lot of that. Hmm. And I think the story gets buried because, okay, so it happens 1911. He's caught in 1913. Yeah. Well, at this time, you know, relations are not good between France and Germany. Yep. And so about a few days after his trial in 1914, World War I starts. And actually, uh, Perugia served in the Austria-Hungary. Uh, uh, he served in the Austrian Armed Forces uh, during World War One. So I think World War One kind of buried this. I mean, it, it, then I think people lost interest. In fact, there was a there was a there was a theory that the Germans were involved because even in 1911, the Germans and the French were butting heads not only in their colonial uh, over colonial possessions, but in Europe itself too. So there was all kinds of crazy theories. A big fear that these were American millionaires who were coming in and buying up, which, well, we see not just American millionaires, but well, billionaires today, buying up art and then taking it out of the country. And mm -hmm. so, but of course, again, the Mona Lisa wasn't really a French painting, so it was Italian. Yeah. And I think there was some of that, where, in Perugia's case, he, that was some of that going too. He thought he was being a patriot by bringing it back to its homeland. Yeah, I'm wondering. What, so, what was the plan when he once he got it? You said he brought it back to his homeland. So eventually, it got to it got to Italy. So, yes. what was the, what was the plan here? Because I mean, how do you have it for two years, do nothing, and then right. you know it could have been the the one that got away. We couldn't just not have the Mona Lisa. It could have been hidden away in that trunk forever. It could have got caught. I mean, I often think, what if Perugia would have went outside one day and got run over by a car or something? I mean, somebody probably would have found it in a trunk. But you're right, things have, stranger things have happened. Things mm -hmm. have gone missing in history for years on end mm -hmm. until they're rediscovered or discovered or whatever you want to call it. So what happened here? Well, in 1913, he finally tries to offload it into an art dealer in Florence, Italy. Okay. Uh, Uffizi Gallery or something of that nature. Yeah, there was some, he either wanted to be paid or he, was, he wanted a ransom of some kind. He wanted to get money for it. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, bring it on down. Let's take a look. Well, meanwhile, what's happening here is the person he contacted, they had contacted another art dealer who came to look at it. They immediately knew what it was from because there was a stamp or something on the back of it. Mm -hmm. They knew it was the stolen Mona Lisa. Like two years later, they're like, wait a minute. They knew something was wrong because this guy was trying to, like, well, how did you get the Mona Lisa? I mean, the whole thing was crazy. How did he come up, you know, end up with it? So... And I think he wasn't thinking correctly because I don't know, even with all the publicity, why you try to sell it. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they sort of stalled him. They, you know, they, they put the old stall tactic on and they were saying, well, you know, let's, let's wait for this. Meanwhile, what they were doing was contacting the local police who came and arrested him. And so he was caught red handed. Yeah. But ironically, he never really got a long sentence, like a year because they thought, well, you know, to some extent he was working out of patriotic motives. And, <laughs> if that, and, that was an excuse for anything. <laughs> and so, yeah, exactly. And so I think he served seven months of a one-year sentence. And he died in 1825, but he had gone back to using his birth name, which is Pietro. Or 1925? or 1925. Yeah, yeah, I was about eight. He's a time traveler Yes, now. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, 1925. <laughs> But, you know, Bertillion was, was, 
the, the, the lead detective. There were like 60 detectives that worked on Jeez. the case. Well, I think the government was so embarrassed by this, they were just trying anything to find it. And in fact, they th thought it was a hoax. They thought, well, this is a hoax. Some will return it in two days and everything will be hunky-dory. How, how, how would you call that a hoax? The painting's <laughs> gone. <laughs> like, it's gone. It wasn't a, it wasn't a frat, you know, yeah. fraternity prank or something. It, it was gone. But yeah, um, so, I, you know, so Bertillion, he is, you know, he's known, but as, the, as this drags on, he's looking kind of incompetent. Mm -hmm. So they thought, okay, we're going to arrest this guy. And there was a guy named Guillaume Apollinaire, and he was a French poet. And in fact, Picasso called him the Pope of Cubism. He wasn't an artist himself, but he was very much a uh, sort of a guy who was always promoting modern art. Okay. And so um, they arrest him. It's a thin read to hang your hat on, but one of, one of this guy's associates was a man named, and I got to read it because it's like four names, uh, Honore Joseph Gary Pire, and uh, he was a Louvre thief. And he was an associate of this Apollinaire. And they also brought Picasso in for questioning. Oh, gosh. Um, but they didn't arrest Picasso. They were threatening this Apollinaire with all kinds of things if he didn't spill the beans. So he gave up this name of a known Louvre thief. And, uh, and in fact, this thief had actually given Picasso a couple of these Egyptian statuettes. But Picasso didn't know where they came from. I don't think he really asked either, but let's... So he was, he was questioned, but they were both released because they weren't involved in it. And I'm thinking, I think this leads to a bigger question of security at the Louvre. If you have known Louvre thieves who are stealing statuettes and paintings right. and then giving them to people, like, here, Picasso, take these. You know, I, I, I just took these. And there was one, I can't remember, I was reading this. I think it was this, this, this Pyre guy and... Uh, he said something to his wife when he was leaving one day. Oh, I'm going to the Louvre. You want anything? I mean, he would make jokes about it. <laughs> That's just so casual. Like, it's like, is there a gift shop? No, just a painting. <laughs> just, 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 we'll just bring in some Egyptian statuary that we, we have. So, um, so, yeah, so it really leads to, it, it, it's interesting because I think it changed so much. But the Mona Lisa became, this is what catapulted it. This is why most people know it when you say the name. Mm hmm not because it's, I mean, it's a great, I mean, of yes, course, it's a yes. wonderful painting, but like, it's just because of this particular event. Yes. It stolen it, and gone for Especially years. in the United States. I mean, it was all over, uh, the New York Times ran front page stories on it. It was all over the press in the United States as well, worldwide. And so, and the French government had total egg on its face. I mean, they, I mean, you're, you're letting people walk on, the whole story is comical in some ways. And this Bertillion, like I said, he wasn't, he wasn't Inspector Clouseau from the Pink Panther. This, he was well known, and, and I think they got more desperate and just started grasping for anything. But, I mean, who would have thought it was just this sort of unassuming guy who went in and took it and left? I mean, I mean that's the most simple, simple way. Because you know, if you walk into walk into a building, you look like you work there, and you leave with a, like a clipboard. I mean, who and, who's gonna know? And I think they were on the right track because they had. Um, uh, I think this was Bertillon. Some other some other investigator said, you know, if, if someone who doesn't know what they're doing, it would take a while to. You know, they they had they had talked to a, th a known art thief who said, I can get something done in two minutes. Mm -hmm. If it's longer than that, then you know, then it won't work. And so they actually tested this. So they thought it had to be someone who knew the painting because when they when they brought people in, they had like a mock-up of it with the kind of um, glass case it was in and the, and the hooks it hung on. When you brought people in who didn't really know it, it took them like five or six minutes to get it off the wall. But when you brought someone who knew it, they could get it right off. So I think they were kind of on the right track, but I think they just couldn't. They just couldn't put their finger on it. <laughs> Man, I'm just wondering, how does... I mean, nowadays, we know that you're not getting the Mona Lisa. <laughs> like, you, you, are, you, are, you can barely walk in there, much less get your hands on it. Yes. In fact, uh, the, 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 the museum closed for like two weeks after this. Mm -hmm. But when it reopened, it was a smash. I mean, people were clogging the place to get in to basically see an empty wall. They wanted to see the empty space. In, Fran in fact, Franz Kafka had gone there 
um, was one of the visitors during that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, people w were leaving flowers by the empty space, <laughs> and they just thought this was a national disgrace, and maybe it was in some ways. But So after they found the painting, though, it stayed in Italy for a little bit. There was a lot of... It's returned to its homeland, but then the Italian government turned it back over to the Louvre. And, yeah, figures. And that's where it stays now. But it's very interesting. There's a couple of really good books on this. Um, one's called Vanished Smile, The Mysterious Theft of the Mona Lisa by R.A. Scotty, and The Crimes of Paris by Dorothy and Thomas Hubler. But there's a quote I wanted to read uh, from, it was an American who was in Paris at the time, okay. and this tells you sort of how unknown the Mona Lisa was. So. He had written home that Paris is Mona Lisa crazy. When it was discovered that the famous painting was gone, the papers got out extras, and there was more excitement about it than there was about the negotiations, negotiations between France and Germany. The newsboys looked upon me as a crazy person when I refused to buy their papers. I had suggested that I didn't even know Mona Lisa. So he's not saying I didn't know the Mona Lisa. He said I didn't know Mona Lisa, so I think he thinks it's a living person. <laughs> so... I feel like that's the equivalent. It's like the equivalent of like some celebrity scandal, in that sense, because it's like, why would I care? There's a whole, there's all this whole world thing going on. You know, we're close to World War One. We're essentially like, right. we're like there. There's this whole political thing going on. Why would I care? <laughs> it's a painting. Who cares? Right. And then it's, you realize how it's Mona Lisa. Like, and it's and it's, you know, it's a point of national pride, especially in that, when tensions were already high going back to like 1910. And leading into World War One, mm -hmm. so I think that's why people felt, well, how does this look to everybody else that we have people basically walking in off the street and stealing things and and walking out? But as we know now, <laughs> you don't do that now because um, the art museums are just. That's why I'm always when you hear art thefts now, it's like, well, that's got to be professional. But then thinking, well, could it be an employee, someone who knows? Especially if there's elaborate security systems in place, who can turn them off? And yeah, how does how does heart theft even work in general? Like, cause <laughs> cause as you said, even when he was trying to sell the Mona Lisa or get rid of it, the artists sold him out. Like they were like, <laughs> uh, let's get the police. How does that even? You're right. And I was thinking of this very question before um, I came over here to record today. I almost think maybe maybe the theft of art itself. Maybe it's more you're, you're, you're more lucrative in forging art. Uh -huh. I've thought of that too, because that way, you know, you're not an art forger. Because it's still the same thing, though, like you said. Because if I showed up, let's say I showed up at Kenosha Public Library one day and said, "Hey, Xander, check out this Mona Lisa I just got on eBay or something." <laughs> now, chances are that's a that's a it's a reproduction. You know? Yeah, it's not the real thing, and I think that's where it gets in. I think that's where you can get into little. I mean, it's, it's really a strange, people still steal art. Mm -hmm. And it's just odd because you're right, how do you sell it? But there's probably a black market for things too. But I think about like in World War II, uh, there was a forger named Hans von Meergen who was Dutch. There's actually a movie, and if anybody is gonna see it, it's called Last of Your Mirror. It's quite good actually. Um, and you never know where he stood because he was, he was uh, tried for collaboration with the Nazis. But his argument was, no, -uh. I knew the Nazis wanted this Dutch art. He was a Dutch Dutch artist himself. Mm -hmm. So we came up with him and another guy came up with this elaborate way to forge a painting. He said we weren't giving them the real things. We were giving forgeries because we didn't want to give them our real art. And so, but it's really interesting because okay, well that sounds good, but yet somehow he still profited from it. But you know, yeah, that sounds interesting because I can imagine if you're making a great forgery right um how like if someone could still take that and it still has some value doesn't it mm -hmm. i think so it's amazing to me how good a forgery you've seen in mm -hmm. in, in the past and now and i don't know art collectors and, and art dealers they know how to spot these things but that's a that's a skill i don't have because i wouldn't <laughs> really, if you put me in a room with a forgery and uh, the real thing if it's really good i probably I probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference, and that's the point. Yeah, but I mean, when it comes to, I guess, are there? When I, I was trying to, I was trying to look some stuff up. When you know, you're talking about stealing the Mona Lisa, I'm like, okay, okay. Do, do, do people just like steal art? Like, as a, as a whole thing, you said it still goes on, but then I'm like, right? Oh, oh I see. How do they get? How do they, you know, 
what happens to it afterwards? Because selling it's hard. We right. know that. Forgery, forgery is an option. But then I'm seeing things like, oh, they just missing. Like they're gone. Yes. They're, that's essentially what almost happened to the Mona Lisa. It's just, it was almost. And, and the only thing I really I think that was helpful. I mean, if he maybe if he would have taken it to a black market and tried to sell it or something, it might have worked. But mm-hmm. again, who's going to hang it in their house? I mean, well. He could, I suppose, because a lot of there's a lot of rich Americans running around with uh, priceless art artifacts in there. I mean, and this is this is common. You know, we were talking about forgery. I was talking about looting too. I mean, you've got the Nazis looting art. You got Napoleon looting art. You've got the Elgin marbles, which were found in Greece, are still in a British museum. The Greeks have been trying to get it back for years because it's ancient. It's an ancient Greek. It's ancient Greek art, but yeah. it's still in the British Museum. So, and then Egypt is a perfect example to me of, of people cleaning stuff out and the Egyptian uh, state getting yeah. not much from Their it. Their artifacts are all the over the place. Their artifacts are all over the place and they're not coming back probably soon, especially King Tut, because that's the most famous one. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was, uh, it was quite the case. And if Perugia wouldn't have sold, I mean, Bertillian didn't solve anything. It was him trying to sell it in Italy that sort of, tip the scales and then when it came back it was like it was under guard you couldn't gendarmes would stand in front of it you couldn't get near it which is kind of what it's like today and so and so now it's worth 860 million (laughs) dollars when the guy stole it it probably wasn't worth a lot because no one really knew what it was except for art historians and that so are, are you saying that for artists having your work stolen can make it more valuable well that's interesting i work with an artist in our department i was gonna Tell her, well, maybe I should steal some of your work. We'll just set up some kind of hoax. But, <laughs> but yeah, so it's, it's just interesting. I thought it was interesting because, um, like I said, the Mona Lisa wasn't well known until it was actually stolen. And then when it was plastered on every newspaper in the world, that's when it became known. Okay. So, so there you go. There, there's a little crime there. A little. Uh, I got to work in Inspector Clouseau. I was trying to figure <laughs> out how to do that. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna man, I'm gonna get my my gear next time. I'm gonna hit up some museums, <laughs> um, see what's there. But yeah, Scott. So what what are we talking about next time? Well, next time I'm gonna t- I talk about the uh, around the world the voyage of Nellie Bly, and uh, it was it sort of was it was sort of inspired by the fictional Around the World in 80 Days by that was a book by Jules Verne. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's quite an interesting character. This was in 1889, she took her trip. She didn't take a balloon like they did in the book, but it was mostly to promote the newspaper she worked for in New York City. So it it leads to all kinds of interesting questions. Plus I love to talk about 19th century American history. So this will be good too, so. Okay, great. 